UK Sailmakers is introducing a new podcast series, Lessons Learned. In episode one, Brendan Huffman from our LA loft chats with Stuart Dahlgren from UK Northwest. Stuart skippered his Santa Cruz 70 westerly in this year's 2100 mile Pacific Cup. They discussed the thinking that went into the sails Stuart designed for this race, how he used them, and which ones he left on the dock. Towards the end, he also shares some novel thinking on what data to display on your on-deck instruments. Welcome to episode one, The Big Jibs Stayed Home. Welcome to the UK Sailmakers podcast. I'm Brendan Huffman with UK Sailmakers Los Angeles. And today we are speaking with Stuart Dahlgren, who runs our Vancouver loft and recently skippered his Santa Cruz 70 westerly in the 2100 mile Pacific Cup from San Francisco, California to Kaneohe on the island of Oahu in Hawaii. Good morning, Stuart. Good morning, Brandon. Thanks for having well, me on. Well, great to see you on Zoom after seeing you in person in Kaneohe and meeting your crew. So you guys sailed a great race. Um, looking at the results here, you guys were second in a very competitive division. That was the AA division, uh, which was eventually won by Piwacket. Um, which I believe won uh, not only line honors, but overall, and you guys were uh, close behind on corrected time. So I want to talk to you about your race. And for those who haven't done West Coast racing or raced to Hawaii before, it's kind of a the race is kind of divided into thirds from a navigation or boat handling perspective, meaning the first maybe third of the race can be really windy, sailing through Gale Alley sometimes. And then the slot car part, where you're kind of on a run in light air, and finally you get into the real Pacific Cup or the real Transpac, where you're, you know, downwind, 20 knots plus, surfing all the way into the finish line. So, Stuart, tell me about the start. We started off of uh, Golden Gate Yacht Club in San Francisco Bay. Uh, it's usually blowing about 20 knots out the gate. And what kind of sail configuration did you have? Yeah, so, um, I mean, we kind of made a... <laughs> Our race this time was kind of four sections with the first section being like less than 1% of the race, but still being relatively important. Um, and that we started inside the bay. Yeah. Pretty typical bay afternoon, like low to mid twenties. Um, we wanted something like pretty conservative in our setup. And so we made the call the morning of the race to, uh, to actually take no, no Genoa's with us. So even though we're rated for 150, three uh, percent light number one um we looked at the forecast and saw that how little that we would use those sails versus the weight of carrying two big overlapping genoas a light one and a heavy number one all the way to hawaii um didn't really make a lot of sense so we actually ended up leaving those on the dock um so we started the race uh full main uh and a number four jib uh, we've got a really good number four that's like you know a fairly recent update to the boat um and so it's, you know, it works really well through the range and the fairly flat water. Like we were also going out um, fairly early in the ebb. Um, so the, you know, the, the wasn't really built up outside the bay. So I was able to, you know, use the number four, sail with that fairly down range, even as we came out the gate and we're able to do a tack change into the number three, uh, just outside the gate where it got quite a fair bit lighter. And then I got a lot lighter uh, and you and know, you're second what, guessing yourself, thinking yeah. of going back to the dock to get a larger Genoa. I had really thought I'd screwed us uh, <laughs> about an hour into the race when it was blowing about eight knots, and you know the leftover chop from it blowing twenty earlier in the same spot. Everyone was struggling, right? Like it wasn't mm -hmm. like it was. It was painful. It was really painful in our boat trying to go, you know, upwind and eight knots with the number three. But, uh, you know, we could see the breeze coming down and then, you know, we saw the, the V, the Reichel P55 kind of get it just a weather of us. And so we're able to tack onto starboard and, you know, just kind of sail towards the coming breeze down. And then, you know, within an hour or so, it was blowing uh, 25 and we're out for the jib reaching. Um, so, you know, there was, and then we never thought about the Genoa's again. So that was like a no regrets decision at that point. Yeah, but so you, was, saved, it, you saved a lot of weight. You saved a lot of space down below. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, we saved probably close to 300 pounds. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I think the Genoa's are about 120, 130 pounds each um, in the bags. So, 
you know, that was just. Stuart, did yeah. you uh, did you have a blast reacher or a jib top? We have a blast reacher. We didn't bring it for this race. Um, the new number four has a, a reaching clue in it. So a higher has a second clue higher up in it. Um, mm -hmm. Again, to try and minimize the weight of carrying two specialty sails. Yeah. We would bring it if there was a forecast that said that that's something we're going to use for 16, 18 hours, but no forecast said that that was going to be a sale. We did bring a jib top. Uh, we had a new jib top this year. Uh, we'd reduced the LP from 154 or 100 like max rated basically area down to 130 percent mm -hmm. um being that the crossover with the code zero was a little too tight so with the sm slightly smaller jib top we could put it up a little sooner um and sail a little higher with it than we could with the old jib top which is kind of beneficial uh because by the time we were into the by the time the big one was good um you weren't very far away from the code zero so widening those crossovers really helped a lot yeah. Um, so we're racing in the ORR uh, rating system. Was there any advantage uh, from a rating perspective to cut down uh, the jib top a bit? Um, and what's your thought on code zeros and ORR? Yeah. So uh, it would have been advantageous to sail with the smaller jib top if we had matched it with a smaller head sail. But obviously, we didn't make that decision until the day of the race. And you can't change your certificate the day of the race. Mm -hmm. So um there was no rating advantage to sail with a smaller jib top what we did play away did play with over the winter is we actually did uh go ahead and build a uh 55 percent mid girth tweener sail for the boat mm -hmm. um and trialed it a bit this spring but again with that with the way the jib top is and how good the 75 percent growth code zero is um we just couldn't find the justification for the rating was 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 pretty hard case to make like it was a pretty significant um pretty significant like it was it was it was multiple hours to the to the race on corrected time to carry that sail and yeah. um you know i don't feel like we would have really used it that much and it's interesting because rage the wiley 70 which was kind of our you know closest boat in type and and, and kind of configuration in the race um had done the opposite of us where they had uh added a 55 percent or 65 percent mid girth code zero to their boat hmm. and so it was interesting because you know since the last time we raced them in 2018 in this race we have done a whole bunch of things like you know bearing the keel a better bottom but actually with the sails going with slightly smaller spinnakers and not added the tweener um where they went the kind of opposite direction and they added the tweener so the net result was you know we felt like we were faster than we were in 2018, but rated slower. And mm -hmm. they felt that they were maybe the same speed, not really any faster, but rated quite a bit faster. So we were pretty happy with that decision. Um, yeah, it's interesting what kind of decisions you have to make months in advance with your sale yeah. plan, uh, whether it's ORR or ORC. Yeah, I think we're going to revisit the the tweener Um because you can sail higher with it, with the 75% girth sail, and it is uh faster in that higher lighter breeze um mm -hmm. than the uh than the jib top or the 75 percent growth and i think you know pacific cup is known for the windy reach right where you know you're basically you know trying to get into that synoptic breeze and once you're in it you're typically in you know 20 plus knots of, of reaching breeze right or 30 so could be yeah 30 or 30 so that's smaller, everyone's wet smaller. and half the crew's seasick yeah, so that smaller jib top combination made a lot of sense for this race. Um, for Transpac, uh, which we're aiming for next year, we will probably revisit the tweener sale because typically that reach is um, a factor, but it's, you know, I, I would say it's probably 10 knots less windy on average um, from the research that I've done in the wind matrix as the trans, Transpac used versus the Pacific Cup wind matrix. Yeah, well, as a Southern California guy, I concur. Uh, with, your, yeah. with your assessment, but more research uh, is required. Um, I want to move on. Um, so get us to uh, when you set the shoot for the first time on Pacifica. Well, that was a long, there's, there's a lot of race in between there. So, I mean, I think the, the quick, the quick progression was, you know, got into the synoptic breeze, uh, spent the first night with the number three on the outboard lead. Um, it lightened a little bit uh, near daybreak. And as we got a little bit further offshore, uh, so we went to the, put the jib top up, um, but we actually, once we put the jib top up, we're a little bit tipped over. So we actually just put the first reef in the main 
Um, and that was a great combination. So we had the Genoa stay sole, one reef in the main sole and the jib top. Uh, and we sailed like that for, I think close to two days. I'd have to look at it, but a long time. And then, uh, you know, as it started to get a little bit lighter, eventually took the reef out of the main and then progressed into the code zero. And then we used the code zero for probably close to another two days, um, like full main, uh, um, general and stasel and, and, uh, and that code zero. And then. And how windy the, was it uh, at that point? So like a lot of our race was sailed in 14 knots. Away. <laughs> like I would say if I had to see a number that was on the gauge that I looked at a lot was like 14 knots. Away. <laughs> and, um, and fairly flat seas, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Even that first night um, when it was windy, it wasn't really built up. Um, so never really, really big, you know, never that like, you know, windy reach where, as you say, everything and everyone is wet because you're just hammering through the back of every wave. Uh, it was pretty pleasant. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty mild. You yeah. Know, that's the way I described it. Obviously we started on Thursday on our, on the Santa Cruz 52 I was on and it was just mostly a pleasant sail, you know, 10 yeah. knots of breeze, but we're going pretty fast with our jib top. And uh, what's interesting, having done eight of these races now to Hawaii, on the windy years, you don't see much in the water, but on a flat, on a kind of a calm year, you see so much garbage, but you also see a lot of sea life. We were seeing turtles, whales, lots of dolphins. Uh, it was fascinating, but unfortunately, there's just a lot of plastic and garbage, whether it's refrigerators, yeah. tires, fishing nets, and uh, that was a bit of a buzzkill for the crew members who never done this race before. And it was a buzzkill for the people who had done the race before. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I, I mean, it's kind of an expectation at this point, but it's, it's a, it's a really disheartening expectation and it's, uh, it's definitely eye opening for people for the first time they see it. You're kind of like you're a thousand miles from anywhere and you know, the traces of humanity and its wastefulness are, are all around you. <laughs> yeah. So that's um, anyway. So, so back to the race. So we probably actually did a day, in a bit with the code zero and then a, probably another day tight reaching with the a3 um mm -hmm. with the genoa stasel inside of it and then um and then you know i think of the first kite that we put up as like a running kite um which is we actually sailed into this area of like um it was definitely we were crossing some sort of isobar line ridge where there was you know pretty significantly different cloud activity and um ended up got really light for a little bit and we were finally the first time we were trying to sail down a bit so we put up the a1 for probably three or four hours and then that kind of passed and when we were on the other side of that we were reaching again so we put the a3 back up um did that probably for another 12 hours and then finally it started to free enough that we started to put the we put an a2 up and then sailed in a, in a basically switch between the a2 and the a5 with the exclusion of the last night before we finished, we sailed with the A3 for about six hours just to climb, um, you know, up above the ley line a little bit so that we had some, um, you know, we knew we were going to be, be able to jibe uh, at the finish and not having to do what Rage did, which is, you know, take the kite down and, and sail in under jib on port. We wanted to be able to jibe onto starboard and sail across right. the finish line with the kite up, just, you know, yeah. making sure. Stuart, there how, was, far there south was did you guys, how far south of rum line did you guys end up um i don't know that we ever end up very far south of rum line at all did you get okay because uh, we in our class most of us were well below rum line but on, on the friday starters you guys must have sailed a uh, tighter course i mean we sailed very close to the rum line we probably sailed less distance than maybe anyone in that race this year and that was probably a high high degree of why we were successful because it's you know it's pretty easy to do well if you can sail the least amount of distance and stay in the breeze which is for the most part what we managed to do and we just had a high degree of reliability like the boat was you know we had the opportunity to really go through the boat we had no real major breakages you know we didn't even have to do that many back downs we did i saw probably more garbage this time than i did in 2018 but we ended up catching less of it and i don't know if that's just sheer dumb luck or what that is but i'll take it now when you guys hauled your boat out after the last race and you're doing a lot of work all around the boat did you put in uh, kelp windows 
Um, the boat, we got the boat. Uh, it had always had a kelp window for the prop and the rudder. Mm -hmm. um, and there was no visual inspection method for the keel. Um, but there is a kelp cutter. Uh, I was, it is and always has been since we've owned the boat. So. And do you have a camera um, underneath or are you just looking through the windows? Uh, just look through the windows. I mean, we have a white leading edge on the rudder. Um, and it's always very easy to see. I can even shine a light down the window at night and see pretty well. Um, we took the window out for the shaft because we converted the boat from a shaft and strut arrangement to a sail drive arrangement because that's mm -hmm. extremely advantageous uh, from a drag and rating perspective. Um, so uh, and we don't have an inspection for that, um, but it's fairly close to the keel. So it's, you know, in my opinion, fairly unlikely that you're going to, um, you know, miss the keel and catch the sail drive somehow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Debris. Cool. All right. Well, let's get back to uh, your approach to the finish the last 24 hours, which is usually the most exciting part of the race. Yeah. I mean, I always say to people when they ask you about a Hawaii race, like, you know, what's your favorite part? And I was just like the last 500 miles, right? Like if you could just airdrop me into the last 500 miles of a Hawaii race, that'd be, that'd be great. Like, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, the other 75% of the race is like, it's great. And, you know, I enjoy being offshore and all that good stuff, but you know, it's a little bit like paying the fun tax at some point. And you're like, you've been reaching tipped over on starboard for four and a half days. You're like, this is a little, mm -hmm. I've been doing this for a long time. I'm ready to do something else now. <laughs> yeah. But that last 500 miles when, you know, you got the squalls and you're, you know, potentially jibing relatively often. And, you know, you get that perfect long Pacific waves and, you know, 20, 25 knots of wind. It's, it's pretty special. It's pretty hard to like, you know. I was, you know, these guys that I first did my first Hawaii race with, and they were like, what's it like? And they're like, well, last 500 miles, you, you wake up and you're planing and you go and watch and you're planing. And then you go down and eat dinner and you're planing and you go to bed and you're planing. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like, well, that's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> I like the sounds of that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we didn't have real, real breeze until the last 20, 20 24 hours or so. Um, and there was kind of that like influence of the, I guess what was tropical remnant or tropical depression Darby at that point wasn't a hurricane anymore. Um, and the big thing about that is we had these really, uh, tall, short waves, which is pretty unusual, um, you know, around Hawaii, in my experience, at least, um, you know, I'm used to those nice big long rollers. So, um, it was good. It was fast sailing. I mean, we had a really fast last 24 hours, um, we used our new, uh, our A25 spinnaker, uh, which was specifically designed to be the same uh, rated area as our A2 spinnaker, mm -hmm. but it's a bit more of a, um, I call it a surfing kite. It just has a more open leech and a slightly shorter luff. And so it's a little bit more forgiving to the trimmers and you can also heat it up and drive around a bit more without it tipping the boat over as much, right? So, you know, what we did find last couple of times is we have these big, we had these even larger, you know, big round day twos, which, you know, in the Pacific Northwest and flat water are amazing, right? Because they allow you to just dig, dig, dig deeper, deeper, deeper. Yeah. But in the ocean, you, you know, especially in those crossover wind speeds at 14, 16 knots, when you're like trying to get going and surfing on waves, and you maybe don't quite have enough horsepower to catch all of them. You put the bow up to try and catch a wave and all that happens is the boat tips over, you miss the wave, and then you're all tipped over and slow in the trough. <laughs> it takes you two or three waves to get going again. Whereas this new sail, you know, uh, doesn't completely solve that problem because it didn't add a ton of horsepower to the boat. But what it did do is, it, you know, when you do heat it up, you can turn more of it into speed and less of it into tipping the boat over, which is pretty beneficial being able to drive around and widen the groove out a little bit. Yeah, think how much more efficient that is, especially when you have drivers chasing waves that they don't get on, thinking of that extra distance over, you know, 500 yeah. miles, what that adds up to. For sure. Yeah, it's pretty massive, right? So um the ability to accelerate in, speaking of that do you ever run into that issue where the driver's more interested in setting the speed record than actually vmg to the finish yeah i mean we did and um we did like we got some pretty amazing tips uh before this race um from a really high-end top end navigator who gave us a couple of tips on how to set up the instruments for this kind of race and so you know, basically the, the key numbers that we were using is when we we're on the reaching, um, we were using a polar boat speed average, but what he taught us to do is take it from expedition 
and the expedition can damp it basically down to 90 seconds. Um, so that, you know, cause up from when you're kind of sailing in the ocean, you're doing like 120, 85, 120, 85. And so, but what tends to be, if you're actually sailing like that, you actually tend to be trending quite a bit lower than you think you are. Mm-hmm. And so by averaging like that, uh, you get a real number and everybody on deck has that number. And, you know, it's not just the watch captain and the skipper always being, you know, going down to the nav desk, looking at it and coming back out and being like, you know, you guys are hotheads. <laughs> yeah. So everybody was accountable to everybody. And it was a massive difference. It like, you know, I think anybody who's done a long ocean race has sailed with someone who hunts around and tries to catch every wave and just set a big boat speed number. Um, and has had that awkward conversation with them telling them that like, you're not doing that well. Like <laughs> your, your VMG is not very good. Um, yeah. And usually it's not a very uh, pleasant conversation. The navigators no, are, the tired, owners are pretty and terse. They feel like and... they're trying and they feel like they're contributing and they think they're doing something well. And then when you have to tell them that they're not, um, you know, as part of a team, that's, that can be difficult and people are yeah. better at delivering that news than, than some others are. So it just takes that whole element away. And then we're doing the same thing when we were running um, using a VMG number mm-hmm. and again, aver- averaging it. So doing an ex- expedition output as a custom channel uh, dampened to like uh, 90 seconds so that, you know, we had a target VMG right beside it, the average VMG over 90 seconds um, on the same display as the boat speed. So there's just a complete speed loop there that tells you, you know, kind of with, with no fallibility, like <laughs> this, is, this is how you're doing. This is the real measurable performance of how you're doing. Yeah, I think that's really important. I've raced on so many boats where people are just interested in hitting 20 knots, even though we're sailing 50 degrees off course to get that 20 knots, and it's just not efficient. This year, I tried something new with my watch. Um, Whenever we uh, got on watch, I would write down, we would all keep track of the mileage where we started, and every hour, we would look at it, and if one hour or four hours, we'd know what our average is, or our average speed was, and what our mileage was. And that I just mm-hmm. changed, I thought that was interesting. First time I'd done that, it just changed the mindset of the crew. So instead of trying to hit 20 knots on every wave, which isn't going to happen on a 52 foot boat that often, instead they're looking at how many miles can we, can we knock off before the end of the watch? Yeah. And, it, and I like the way that, you know, got more of the team involved, including the trimmers and the grinders, instead of just the driver taking credit uh, for how well he or she did. So I'm going to yeah. probably expand on that. But I like what your navigator told you as well. Yeah, no, it was it was super beneficial. It's it's changed the way I think about that kind of sailing and, and managing it with the team offshore. And so uh, something I'm going to take with me forward for sure into other teams that I go sailing with. Obviously, we had all the tools with the ability with, you know, proper displays to be able to display custom channels, et cetera. But I'm sure there are ways to do it with less complicated systems. As long as you're running expedition, there's a way to do it. Stuart, I want to ask you before we wrap up, as you get ready for Transpac next year from Los Angeles, uh, what changes might you make to your sail plan? Uh, yeah, I think the only thing we're really talking about is, um, so we took, I think that, well, two changes. One, one change is going to be that we took uh, two A2s and one A2.5 mm-hmm. um, to kind of have three max rated sails so that we could kind of just you know, never really have to think about peeling down or not. It has to be really, really windy, basically, for us to consider peeling down to, you know, we're not trying to preserve a sail. We're trying to just go as fast as we can. Um, And uh, I think we would, if, I think we want to have the the ability at least to take two A2.5s and one A2, uh, because we just outused that sail uh, and outperformed with that sail considerably. So, um, we're really, really, really happy with that sale. And, um, you know, we did some interesting things with the construction of that, doing a polyester tack box and some other stuff. And, uh, I was pretty worried about it in the like 25 knots and short waves. Cause it's a pretty firm kite as far as an ocean runner kite on that type of boat goes. Mm-hmm. And so I was pretty worried that when we stuffed it into a wave, the thing was just going to pop off the tack. Patch. <laughs> but it was, it was great and it's fine. And we've looked at it since, and it's been really good. So that's one thing for sure. Uh, we're going to look at. And the other thing is we're going to revisit that code 55, do some more testing with it, find out where the crossover is that it's, it is better than the jib top or the, uh, the code, the 75% curve code, and then kind of compare that to some of the, the scoring wind matrix, scoring wind matrixes, uh, for, 
um, Transpac and figure out what, what that would cost us in that race and if it's what we think it's beneficial. So, yeah. Very good. Well, Stuart, a pleasure to talk to you. Congratulations on, on a fine race. Um, I'll look for you next year um, after Transpac. And uh, that concludes uh, our podcast with Stuart Galver, excuse me, Stuart Dahlgren, who's our loft manager and owner of our sail, UK Sailmakers Loft in Vancouver, British Columbia. Stuart, great to see you. I uh, hope to see you in person next summer. See you, Brandon. Good talking. Thanks for listening. This has been the podcast for UK Sailmakers. For more information about UK sales, you can reach us on the web, www.uksailmakers.com. And you can find a loft near you. Thank you.